All right, once more, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second part of the workshop. Um, a series of talks will be started this morning by Tim Brown. Tim is director of the ANU mode of the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility in Canberra. And he has led the design and the implementation of all the imaging based capabilities and the setup of all facilities there. And I think he is very much devoted to digital innovation. And therefore we look forward very much um, to his talk um, on dynamic controlled environments, 3D scanning, digital twins and scaling from the lab to field. Next trend phenotyping, where to from here? Tim, the stage is yours. You're sharing your screen already. So please go ahead and um, present your talk. Thank you. So as, as Thomas said, I'm the, well, I'm the lead for digital, digital innovation now at the AMU node of the Anchorage facility. Um, and I'm talking about 3D scanning and digital twins and dynamic environments. So um, in Australia, it's customary to acknowledge the traditional landholders of the land on which you live. And so I'd like to pay my respects to the Ngunnawal people and the elders past, present and emerging. This is a picture of the beautiful landscape that we live in down here. The Australian Plant Phenomics Facility was funded in 2010 and under the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. And the goal was to build phenomics infrastructure for to support research, um, public and private, and uh, both national and international clients. And we do this across all scales from highly controlled environments in the lab out to um, usual drones and LIDAR and, and field components. There are three nodes of the APPF, the Plant Accelerator in Adelaide, the High, Re high Resolution Plant Phenomics Center that's here in, at CSIRO in Canberra along with us and in our phenomics group at ANU. The ANU node, you can see a picture down in the corner here, um, is, is part of ANU Plant Sciences and we're home to world-class genomics and plant science faculty and facilities. And this is really great because we have the opportunity to tap into a lot of expert knowledge there's also a bunch of other groups at ANU that we collaborate with, including SEAT, the Center for Entrepreneurial Agrotechnology, and they're tasked with building across the cross-disciplinary approach to building agrotech innovation. And this is really good because there are a lot of groups up until now at ANU that haven't really collaborated that well together, but a lot of capacity. And so SEAT has been leading the way and bringing us together to build uh, some really cool projects, which I'll talk a bit about later. The Research School of Biology and ANU have many, have had um, historically multiple seven year funded large research projects, including the Center of Excellence in Transcendental Photosynthesis and Plant Energy Biology, and um, Centers of Excellence in Robotic Vision and Computer Vision. And the current one we have up, which is exciting, is the ARC Training Center for Future Crops Development. If you have any people looking for PhDs uh, and they can write a very fast application, there are 20 PhD positions that are coming in a, a pri uh, pr partnerships with industry to look at future crops development, as well as to uh, postdoc fellowships that are the applications are doing a little bit later. So at the ANU node, um, I threw these pictures in. I don't know if any of you have the new uh, iPhones, but you can walk around and scan things in 3D with LiDAR on your phone, which is pretty cool. So these are some 3D scans I've done of our facility. And our focus is really on high precision growth environments for understanding genotype by environment interactions. And in doing this, we really are focused on creating open source tools for enabling low cost, low cost plant phenotyping and environmental sensing, as well as building scalable data architectures for fair data um, to enable better phenomics and field sensing. And then all you have, once you have all that data, we need better tools for interacting with it, which I'll also talk about in a bit, including um, VR and AR tools and digital twins and the like. And as we all know, when, once you have those sorts of data organized, making meaning of them can be really challenging. And that's where machine learning and AI um, and novel tools like 3D hyperspectral phenotyping come in that I will also talk about. So our growth facilities, we have a range of um, PC2 quarantine 
and, and quarantine certified facilities, um, including just standard growth facilities, what we call the um, spectrophenoclimatron. So these are the ones that do dynamic real world environmental lighting conditions with glass houses. And we have uh, more recently four shipping containers that PSI built for us with eight rooms that have high precision growth environments. And I'll go into those in more detail as well. We have a plant scan system, which we just found out last week, we're getting funded for a full refurb, which is really exciting. And that measures um, photosynth photosynthesis through fluorescence and thermal and whatnot across um, something like 20 trays of plants, so 400 plants at a time. And we have close linkages with ANU bioinformatics and genomics computer vision focus. The growth capsules uh, we added through a GRDC grant in 2017, and they're really great because they're very high capacity. They're about five environs worth of plants. They can do high light. They were custom built for us to do high light and multispectral light, as well as supporting dynamic lighting environmental controls. They're very energy efficient, and we have a Phenospex plant eye system in one of them and LiDAR in another one. And so we can do things like measuring daily water consumption, 3D scanning, transpiration efficiency, and talk a bit about my own side. So we've been really excited. We've been having a lot of success with the Phenospecs um, dual plant eye. Their, their current version is the F600, which is even higher resolution. Um, but there's just a, a, a massive list of things that you can get out of these sensors. And they're, they're really, they work really well. And Phenospecs has been great to work with. And that's embedded in one of our capsules, so we can grow plants in situ and do you know, daily or hourly even 3D scanning of every single plant. Uh, before I go on into more of the, the code and capabilities we developed, I wanted to talk a bit about what sort of design paradigms it's helpful to think about when you're developing um, data management and um, phenotyping capabilities. And this is particularly important from our perspective, because we're tasked with building national infrastructure. And so rather than building bespoke things that work just for us, I really want to be building um, you know, capabilities that can be scaled up more widely and more widely useful. And so I think the first, the first thing that's really important to try and do is really focus on open source and reusable solutions. You know, software is nice because you can solve a problem once and then many other people can use it quite easily in a way that doesn't scale with hardware as much. So solving things once for everyone is really important. And when you get funding that has strings attached around IP, you end up with non-open solutions. And this can really be a problem because you create developmental dead ends. So if you spend a year or two developing a capability with an industry partner and there are tight IP controls on it, you may be able to license that to people, but the ability to just give that capability away so that it can be implemented widely gets limited. And so wherever possible, it's important to try and build open solutions or at least as, as open as possible. Being domain agnostic is also important, right? Because although some of us work in the field on single plants and some of us work in, you know, in, sorry, in, in, the, in the lab on single plants or in the field, it really shouldn't matter, right? Plants are plants. They all, they all have leaves and architecture. Sensor data is sensor data, whether it comes from a lab or field, and pixels are pixels. And so if you take a domain agnostic approach, which I'll, I'll talk about more in a minute, it really helps you build scalable solutions. Of course, we want to create findable, you know, fair data. But a thing that I think is maybe less appreciated is that if you have method data, method development platforms like um, things like Jupyter Notebooks that are linked to national scale infrastructure and storage, you can, they're linked to fair data, you can much more rapidly iterate and improve knowledge discovery. So you can write code that works with the data that's already held in, in your national data archives. And then when people publish the code in the data, other people can pick that up and begin working on it immediately rather than having to mess around getting everything into your development architecture. And so, I think that's a really exciting thing that's come out recently with Jupyter Notebooks and that sort of thing. And it really has sped up the rate at which people can do development. So the I'm going to talk a bit now about the software stack that we've developed at ANU for managing our controlled environment facilities. And it's, it's a really full stack solution. So it covers everything from controlling chambers and capsules to lights and cameras. It includes logging information, you know, you need to control the chambers, you need to measure what you thought you were doing, plus what the chamber actually did. And then you need errors and alerting and data QA and QC. 
we want to better simulate the real world. And so we have software for creating dynamic, semi-realistic climate conditions. And this all needs to link natively into data management solutions that let you store, view, and retrieve the data. Because as we all know, phenomics creates lots of time series numeric data. And um, there are lots of imagings and more image data and more challenging data types like 3D and hyperspectral or 3D hyperspectral through time. And so you need ways of managing viewing that data as well as ways of seeing if your things are actually working. And then finally, once you have all your data in the framework, you can do things with it. So you want to be able to analyze and interpret it and, and do modeling and things like XR with it. So the trick, as I said, our trade capture stop is a full stack solution. The focus is on modular. So, you know, rather than building a thing that controls a conviron chamber, we build a chamber control system that then has a plugin for conviron chambers. And then when we got the PSI growth capsules, we didn't have to rewrite the whole system to manage the growth capsules. We could just, you know, write a specification that that specify the API for the growth capsules and plug that into our modular system that already ran the combines. And so that works the same with lights. So we can control the combined lights and PSI lights and here spectral lights all using the same software just with a different um, spe specification module. The whole system is dockerized and some of it's server free. So for example, you know, Lots of the chamber and the growth capsule controls run on dockerized systems, and then the, the ingest of sensor data and the camera data now happens server free in the cloud through Azure functions. And the server free architecture, if you don't know about it, is really neat because rather than, you know, originally you had to run everything on a server that was you know, somewhere in your office, then we we're able to go into the cloud using virtual machines. What Docker does is it lets you wrap all of that code and all your dependencies up in something that you can just clone. So if you make, you know, for example, we had a system for running our conviron cabinets. We built that for one of them, then we scaled it out to the seven climatrons, and then it just took a morning to scale it out to 20 more cabinets in the facility because we had a modular thing that could do that one time and we just made 20 of those. If you push that into the cloud, you get um, a system where if you have one you know, you have a workflow for taking IP camera data in. If you have that working for one or 10 cameras, adding 20 more is pretty much the same because you just, the, the server free function just sits there waiting for a camera to push data at it. It pops up, does what it's told and disappears. So it, it scales much more easily than conventional solutions. This whole system by and large is implemented in Python and Go and a software package called TickStack. Um, TickStackit is made up of a couple of things. It, it's a software called Telegraph for process management. So, you know, this, this makes sure that all the things are running. This is sort of like the um, task manager on your computer or with the, the automated task manager in Windows or similar things in um, Linux. InfluxDB is a database system that's designed for dealing with massive amounts of um, numeric data. And, one of the problems we found when we were starting out is that, you know, if you're trying to manage a million images or 15 second interval data for 10 years of weather data, lots of, lots of databases and systems just aren't designed for things of that scale. But because the tick stack was designed for things like monitoring Netflix server farms at the microsecond scale for 10,000 servers, we can't, you know, even with phenomics data, you can't, you can't throw enough data in it to slow it down. So it's really well optimized for huge amounts of time series data. And so that works really well for the sorts of things that, that we do in phenomics as well. And it's also very well documented because it's, um, you know, because it's a commercial product that's used by lots of people at the enterprise level. It's very well documented. It works really well, but they're, they're free tiers that we can use for the scale of things we're doing. So it, so it's basically no cost to us, but it has a really good API and it's solid software. Grafana then links into Influx and lets you visualize data online, which I'll show in a minute as well. So onto the dynamic environmental conditions. Of course, we all know that normal growth chamber conditions like this red line here, that we just sort of typically what you do, you might have more or less light or shorter, longer days, but that really is nothing like what you know the real world looks like. And so the solution for this that we developed, this was led by Professor Justin Borovitz at ANU, was a software package called SolarCalc that lets you calculate dynamic environmental and lighting conditions 
anywhere in the world. So you can put in GPS coordinates and a date range and it will give you dynamic conditions. And so you can see here, this was an eight year experiment at a location in New South Wales, where we simulated a location in New South Wales with temperature and humidity. And you can see the, you know, the annual, the daily changes and the annual shifts to having more light and more humidity as, as it goes into summer and then back into autumn. The software, the original version was a somewhat janky JavaScript version, which you can still download. And now we also have online versions that can let you either get a day file that you repeat over and over or a full seasonal range like this. It's also available in Python if you want to implement this for yourself. And I think this has also been implemented now by um, Combiron in their, their control systems as well. And so that spits out these native control files that then can be run by our systems to create dynamic conditions. And as I was saying, you need some way to monitor your, your environments as well. And so this is an example of the Grafana interface. So all of that data that gets pushed into Influx for storing it can get visualized online. So we have a whole bunch of um, dashboards like this that let us let us see what's going on. You can see this was a um, this was just a diurnal cycle. We we typically just repeat one day over and over because that's a lot easier than dealing with long-term seasonal changes. You can see that the the control temperature and set point and the actual temperature was super precise in our capsules, but the humidity, we were having humidity problems, so the humidity didn't track so well. But having a dashboard like this is super helpful because you can see, you know, the breakdown of all the lighting, you can see what the temperature condition, you can see errors like this where the, the humidity is not tracking the way you want it to, as well as seeing live cameras. The ingest system, so as I said, our cameras push things. You, you can either run this um, like on a VM or in a Docker system on a Raspberry Pi, or you can have it totally server free running on Amazon or Azure in the cloud. This ingests the camera images and puts out a whole bunch of statistics like this. So this is a, um, how long is this? It's a couple month period from one of our cameras in the field with RGB image counts and then lets you see file size. So when this drops to zero, like you can see happened on the bottom here, you know, you know something went wrong quite quickly. And there's also an integrated um, error reporting system that you can change it to push things to say Slack to get updates or to actually log issues straight into GitHub to notify people that they need to do that. So in addition to the sort of straight CE work, we're also doing work developing an open source 3D hyperspectral scanner. This is a collaboration between the ANU College of Computer Science and Engineering and the CSRO node at APVF and ourselves. And this is led by CIAT, who I was talking about earlier. And the goal is to make an open source 3D hyperspectral scanner. So we'll be taking um, a VNIR camera, Intel resource scanners, and a gantry system like this, putting them all together. We have a working prototype that runs on the PSI, our PSI hyperspectral scanner, but we wanted to build one that was open source and pretty low cost that we could publish all of the, all of the design schematics and everything for us. So this was a much easier to use solution for everybody. So this will have, um, this has robot operating system based hardware control, which the CSRO folks have been working on in a field capacity. It'll output 3D hyperspectral indices and include a capability to merge the 3D and the hyperspectral data into a nice 3D hyperspectral model. And um, in addition to the standard phenotypes and spectral indices, we'll be able to, what I think is really exciting about this is once you have a system like this, you can start creating really nice, clean benchmark data sets. So you can characterize all the sensors, get them all to stick everything into nice 3D plants with hyperspectral data, and then release those data sets as, you know, so far this is the best in show for what we have, but other machine learning people can, can take those to, to try and improve on methods. You can also start adding in new sensors, right? So right now we're looking at using one of the specimen sensors, but you might have a head wall or something else. You can bolt that onto the same gantry system and then you can have nicely aligned data sets from say three different hyperspectral cameras, which again, in terms of methods development is really exciting because you can say, well, is the $20,000 sensor better or worse or the same as the $80,000 sensor? But you really can't do that unless you have a framework that lets you start bolting multiple types of sensors onto the same, onto the same hardware. Now I'm gonna talk a bit about how we're using these same capabilities to scale from lab to field. And so, as I said earlier, if 
if you de design things in a dom domain agnostic way where you just treat pixels and locations and you know sensor data as, as the same wherever they are, it lets you do, you know, it lets you really quickly iterate to new applications. So in um, 2018 or 19, we got funded for the, to build this Australian mountain research facility. Um, this was to put in 10, 10 sites in the Australian mountains to look at climate change. And we were hired to do the hardware control and data management for the sensor data and phenocams because that was our expertise. And so in addition to building a system just for the AMRA folks, I wanted to build a system where if you're gonna put you know, Campbell or Davis systems in the field and phenocams, it should be much easier to do so you don't have to spend as much money hiring people like us to make that all work. And so you know, they were using Campbell systems, but we're also gonna set this up with Davis systems. We had phenocams. But we just use the same code base that I showed previously, because if you think of what a chamber is doing, the chamber is measuring temperature, humidity, PAR, you could be measuring soil moisture, and you have cameras that are collecting data. So we use that entire pipeline that we already had for processing the same data for the AMRA system. And then that all went online by an API using Grafana, as I showed earlier. And all of this code is open source and runs in the cloud, so it's really easy to reproduce if you want to put out another field site either in the same area or with a completely different application. So here's uh, Tim, an example Tim, of it. Tim yep. sorry, are, are you observing the time? We are pretty advanced to have also a couple of minutes time for questions. How much How much longer do I have? Five minutes? Uh, well, two or three minutes maybe. Okay, I'll jump, I'll jump ahead then. Thank you. Um, so yeah, moving on to this one, the, the once you have all that 3D data, being able to interact with it can be really a challenge. And so um, we're also working on a 3D interface online. This is called, this is in an application called Cesium. And what this lets you do is embed 3D data into a map like this. So it's sort of like Google Earth on steroids, but you can embed both. Um, for example, here we have the, the new growth facility. Here's one of those growth capsules that I was talking about, but you can actually zoom into that the growth capsule and see the 3D data just in situ right here. And so here's, you know, this is me standing on a 3D map inside an actual capsule in the geolocation of that, looking at the 3D scanner data from the Pheno specs. But not only can you do that, but you can do that for um, field data as well, right? So you can jump to, whoops, let me jump over here. You can jump to um, another field site in Australia and see here's 3D point cloud data that also we can see in, um, in time series. If, oh, this is the problem with doing live demos. They crash, but yeah, so there, there you can see this is in this exact same interface, we're looking at, um, we're looking at field data from a, from a scanner, from a drone in this case. So moving along, um, what, what you need to do once you have all this data is really a challenge because you know phenotyping data are complex in 3D and geospatial. And so what we really want is the Iron Man interface, right, for interacting with our data like this, but we don't have that yet. So, so the goal is how do you build that sort of an interface? And we're we're working on that using VR. So for example, um, here's a, a VR example within the growth capsules of modeling the plants. And now that we have the pheno specs, we can actually prop parameterize this with real live data coming, coming off of the Pheno specs. Um, you can also apply this in the field and there are techniques like, uh, it's called procedural modeling where you can, um, this, this is a game engine, but it's, it's building these models based on biophysical properties of plants. So you can start building frameworks where you go from the data held in cesium straight into, into a game engine model that actually builds realistic looking environments like this. Uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I'll skip through that. It, if you Google Adelaide Digital Twin, um, you'll be quite impressed with the framework that they built for that. Um, and we've done this both in the National Arboretum in Australia. So here's using drone data and linking that into a game engine model. We did this a long time ago, back in about 2015. Um, and then now here's an example of using the same kind of thing with more modern, um, with more modern tools to, to build a geospatial model of a field site in Australia. And actually you can you know, model it nearly the individual raindrop level flowing of, of 
water over the landscape. But you can also do the same thing within the growth capsule, right? So you want to build frameworks where you can take your data from, from whichever context it is and, and put it into these, these digital modeling systems. Um, this is the last slide. So I just want to say that you know all of this stuff is in its infancy, right? We're in the midst of this massive change of what we can do. You know, when, when I was a kid, this is what a Microsoft Flight Simulator looked, now, looked like. And now Microsoft Flight Simulator has actual real-time weather data for the entire planet that you can see that's running in 3D over an entire model of the planet that has every you know, tree and house in the planet near the model. So that's the scale of things that we can imagine. And those are the sorts of tools that we're gonna to need to, to tackle food security and climate change. Um, but we're an exciting time because we, we have the capabilities to do that now. That's it, thanks. Tim, thank you very much for this great presentation. It's very dense, a lot of information. Yes and um, a beautiful outlook of what is possible or will become possible. Fantastic. Um, so I so assume there are a couple of questions, um, comments. I would like to invite also people in the Zoom video conference to raise their hands. Mark here in the audience. So hi, Tim. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Um, I was wondering, so you, you introduced these, these beautiful uh, environment chambers uh, where you can control the amplitude uh, and everything. Did you, did you challenge these systems to see whether you can, can uh, get field-like phenotypes inside? It's a good question. I mean, it's, that's why I put natural in quotes, right? Because it's, <laughs> you know, people have a hard time even reproducing conditions between, between chambers and have the same outcomes even when you're running the same conditions. So it, it's an ongoing challenge. Um, there, I'm trying to remember the folks in the last talks we had with, with this working group, there were people that had done some much more extensive work than we had on that. And it is a challenge. I think, I think we can get closer. And so what you really wanna do, right, is measure the field better and then also reproduce that better in the lab and try and bring those two things together. They're still, they're still quite far apart, um, but, you know, the quality of our glass houses is really crappy compared to the quality of conditions we can do in the in the growth capsules. And the growth capsules are a lot better than the Kabarin one we're running because the Kabarins are 10 years old and the growth capsules are pretty new. So it's we're getting there. Um, there there has been work on that. We haven't we haven't dug that into that as deeply as some people have. You and great success <laughs> to you. Okay. I also have a question in that direction. Um, actually, on your strategy. Uh, do you try and or do you want to simulate more or less exactly what happened or happens in nature so to run more or less by the minute the exact profile that you measure or is your strategy rather to simplify make an uh, abstraction or, or abstraction from what you see in nature and simulate something that is typical but is perhaps not um, the exact course of the events uh, over a certain day or a couple of days? For, for our work, we do the latter um, because we're, you know, we, we just did a big experiment where we grow eucalyptus that was collected from all over New South Wales in 2020, in, in 1999 conditions and in 2040 conditions. And in that case, we just wanted to see, you know, for, for normal diurnal conditions at, at a particular time of the year, what's the genetic variation in response to climate? And then we added some heat events. So we're not so interested in the minute by minute experiment so much as generally, you know, if you have a coastal environment versus an inland environment, if you have a drier environment versus a hotter at night environment. Um, and so that, but it really depends on your questions. I know there are folks that have done that sort of thing, um, but yeah, the, there's so much variation that's really hard even when you start just having a few heat events, it gets it gets complex so fast. You have to, it's it's hard to know which which thing which of the many moving parts you're simulating is the thing that's driving the signal that you're getting, and so you, it's sort of a you know you, you have this endless problem of wanting more complexity, but then too much complexity breaks your statistics and, and your head. So exactly. you you sort of have to pick pick your challenges. Yeah, we follow the same strategy in, in our phenosphere um, as we discussed yesterday. So it's also 
trying to simplify, come down to typical profiles and then try to compare to modified profiles, including also, of course, potential future scenarios. And a lot of it depends on your question. You know, if, if, if you're a person that really cares about minute by minute lighting variation, like we did, we've done experiments where we added a daily flux of light and we saw really different behavior in the phenotypes of Arabidopsis. So that was quite interesting. But generally, we're not we're not interested in you know ten minute interval lighting changes so much as a normal diurnal cycle and seasonal things. So we'll we'll grow things in the end of summer to get them up so they're pretty happy, and then as they go into fall, it'll start to get colder and the days get shorter in the chambers, and you you sort of can stretch out the phenotypes in response to that. But we don't really need to have minute by minute changes to do that. All right, you have to, you have to pick your battles. All right, exactly. <laughs>